Good morning, children of God. Welcome to Asbury United Methodist Church. We're so glad uh, that you are here today, whether in person or watching this online. My name is Kristen Wallove, and I serve here on the staff at Asbury as Director of Spiritual Formation and Membership. And we are a church who wants to help you and all of us together put our faith into action. I have some announcements to share with you today. Thanks for filling out your contact cards. Uh, hopefully we won't be needing them for contact tracing, but just in case we want to know that you are here so we can um, be as safe as possible. Feel free to also fill out the purple connection cards that are in your bulletin and you can place those in the offering plate when that time comes. We do offer three adult Sunday school classes that have begun just a few weeks ago. They happen at 10 o'clock right before this service here, and they happen right out there in the administrative wing, three different classes. Uh, everyone is welcome to attend any of those. If you have any questions about those, please feel free to see me or contact me. Speaking of wonderful classes that everyone's welcome at, in uh, October, on Mondays, we're going to be offering a study called Fearfully and Wonderfully. Sarah Lewis is going to be leading uh, a limited person in, a limited seating in-person study uh, Monday nights beginning in October. So if you are interested in that, please uh, email me or come see me during the week in the office and I will get you signed up for that. Um, this study, this book is a wonderful book about a, a medical doctor and a theologian and, and their different perspectives and they're kind of woven together as we think about the human body, the cells and the systems and also the body of Christ. And um, so it's a very interesting class. I highly recommend it. We continue to collect donations uh, for those affected by all of the recent hurricanes. Uh, we do that via UMCOR or United Methodist Committee on Relief. So uh, if you are feeling led to um, donate to that cause, we encourage you to do that and thank you so much for that. Why Comico Goes Purple continues just for a few more days in the month of September. Thank you so much already for your um, generous donations the, in the food bin uh, that's also located in the admin hallway there. Uh, any food donations you bring on the non-perishable foods will benefit local recovery houses. So a few more days you can do that here in uh, in Wicomico County and um, in case you don't know Wicomico Goes Purple is an awareness campaign about opioid addiction and that epi epidemic that affects so many so many folks not only here but um, throughout our nation. We are excited to report that middle school and high school youth Sunday school did begin today so uh, we're again very happy to report that uh, slowly uh, eking our way back to some sense of normalcy as safely as we can um, that is our first concern is everyone's safety and to do no harm so thanks for your continued cooperation and hopefully small children's Sunday school will be beginning as well soon so let's turn our hearts to what we are thinking about in worship today we continue with our worship series called On the Mend, God is in the Healing Business. And this month we have been looking at the way God works in our lives to bring us wholeness. Our North American culture tends to honor the competitive spirit. But being the greatest is not just a recent obsession, it seems like it was popular among Paul's day too. But the pride of being number one can come at the cost of trampling others. So Paul turns the definition of being first upside down. It is in humbling ourselves like Christ that we become closer to God. What relief and healing could come by letting go of the need to be right, to be first, or who will win? What relief and healing could come by letting go of the need to be right, the need to be first, or the need to win? And this would squarely fall under the spiritual discipline of submission. Let us ponder that question as we continue in our worship. Good 
Good morning. Please rise for the greeting. If you come with a need to prove your worth or with a knowledge that everyone is worthy in the eyes of God, if you come to make a name for yourself or to do good things in the name of God, if you come wanting to be the best or content to be the least, Come now, Christ of the proud and the meek. Come now, Christ of those who choose grace over defense. Come now, Christ of those who lead by the example of humility. Please join me in the opening prayer. Font of every blessing, we come to you this morning, opening our parched places to receive the springs of living water you offer to us. Fill us with your living water that will transform our spirits and souls into springs that burst forth with life and love for your people, for ourselves, and for our world. Amen. The first reading is from Exodus chapter 17, verses 1 through 7. The whole community of Israelites left the desert of sin and traveled from place to place as the Lord commanded them. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So they complained to Moses by saying, give us water to drink. Moses said to them, why are you complaining to me? Why are you testing the Lord? But the people were thirsty for water there. They complained to Moses and asked, why did you bring us out of Egypt? Was it to make us, our children, and our livestock die of thirst? So my, Moses cried out to the Lord, what should I do with these people? They're almost ready to stone me. The Lord answered Moses, bring some of the leaders of Israel with you and go where the people can see you. Take the staff you used to strike the Nile River. I'll be standing in front of you there by a rock at Mount Horeb. Strike the water and, and water will come out of it for the people to drink. Moses did this while the le leaders of Israel watched him. He named the place Massa, testing, and Meribah, complaining, because the Israelites complained and because they tested the Lord, asking, is the Lord with us or not? This is the word of the Lord. The second reading is from Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ, any comfort from his love, any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges he took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Dear friends, you always followed my instructions when I was with you, and now that I'm away, it is even more important. Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear, for God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. This is the word of the Lord.
Please stand for the reading of the Gospel. The Gospel reading is from Matthew chapter 21, verses 23 through 32. Jesus entered the temple courts, and while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. By what authority are you doing these things, they asked, and who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, I will also ask you one question. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or of human origin? They discussed it among themselves and said, if we say from heaven, he will ask, then why didn't you believe him? And if we say of origin, we are afraid of the people, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. Then he said, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and son said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. 
Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? The first they answered. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of heaven ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe in him. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Every day, every day, I have to walk down to the water, and I have to get water for my crops. Oh, it's such a task. And of course, I have one pot on my right, and I've got one pot on my left. And this is my routine. <laughs> Even though I am an old pot, I look brand new. I am able to bring my farmer a full pot of water. I'm an old pot too, but I have a crack. He fills me to the top, but by the time we get back to the farm, I only have half the water left. I am proud of what I can do for my farmer. Gosh, I wish I could carry as much water as she does. But I'll tell you, I am so miserable that I can only carry half the amount. Long ago, I fell off a rock next to the stream, and I got this crack. And now, it leaks all the way home. Ugh, it has been one hot summer here. 
I just, uh, I need to go and get myself some water here at the water here. Oh. I am so ashamed. Tomorrow, tomorrow I'm going to talk to the farmer. I want to apologize for failing him every day. And I know he's got to be frustrated that I can't do what I'm supposed to do. Maybe he could find a new pot like me. Um, can I, can we talk a minute? Well, sure. Yeah, well, what? I'm sorry I'm a cracked pot. I feel badly that I make more work for you every day. Now look, 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 I know that, that, that you, you're a cracked pot. And, and I've always known about your flaw, okay? And it's okay. Because look, look here, turn around. Look over here. Do you know that I planted flower seeds on your side of this path? And look. Wow. There's no flowers on my side of the path. Ah, <laughs> but see, every day when we walk down this path back to the farm, that water that leaked from your pot, well, it watered all these beautiful flowers. So I'm not upset at all because, look, for the past two years, I've been able to pick these beautiful flowers to decorate my house. So see, cracked pot, you are perfect, just the way that you are. You make everyone happy. Wow. I guess everyone has cracks and flaws, maybe even me. Everyone, no matter how broken they are, they are all good and all worthy for the farmer. The yeah. end. It's amazing to me that God makes us special um, just the way that we are and that oftentimes um, those things that we feel worst about in ourselves can sometimes turn into a miracle in the midst of what we are doing. So I, I want to start off today by telling you a story. Um, when Sarah and I were newly married, um, and we worked together over at the DuPont plant in Seaford. We had bought a house in Bethany Beach, and so every day uh, we would drive from Bethany to Seaford and back again. Now, Sarah, when we first started, was on shift work. She was a shift supervisor, so her schedule was really erratic because it would rotate from first, second, to third shift. My schedule, on the other hand, was always during the day. So once in a while, we actually got to ride together in the car on the way over to the plant and back. And so there was one of those days coming up, and the first one for a long time. And so Sarah thought it would be something special. She decided to make us breakfast to eat in the car on the way. And she made a wonderful breakfast, something easy and portable. Uh, many of you have probably done it. She made an egg sandwich. Two pieces of toast, a slice of cheese, and an egg in the middle, a fried egg in the middle. So we, we, we load everything up, and because she made breakfast, we're running a few minutes behind, and I'm scrambling to try to get stuff in the car, and she's scrambling to get stuff in the car. And we jump in the car and we head down the road. And we've gotten about a mile down the road and I pull out my egg sandwich and I take a big bite of it. And 
I wasn't really paying attention because when I took that big bite of it, the yolk shot right out of the other side of the sandwich and into my lap and on the steering wheel. Now, to preface that, Sarah had asked me back at the house, do you want me to go ahead and pop your yolk uh, now or do you want to leave it the way that it is? Oh, no, I like it running. Leave it the way that it is, of course, I tell her. And here I am driving down the road and all of a sudden I'm wearing my breakfast. So what do you do when you're wearing your breakfast? I unloaded on this poor sandwich, just started yelling, and I rolled down the window with the old crank handle, because that's what we had in the car at the time, and I threw the sandwich out the window and kept on driving, splattering yolk all over the steering wheel and all over the windshield now, because in my haste to throw it out the window, I whipped it with such force, it's everywhere. And Sarah, you know, we're newly married, she's not seen me act like this before. And she lived up to her name, right? If you remember Sarah back in the, uh, in the book of Genesis, she got her name because she laughed, right? Sarah starts laughing at what is going on. Not because, well, she probably did think it was funny at the time, but also because she didn't know what to do, and her gut instinct when her anxiety level goes up and she doesn't know how to react is to laugh, which at times is really annoying. <laughs> So here I am, angry already. She's laughing at me. I've got stuff all over the windshield. And she's like, well, turn around. Let's go home and clean this up. And I'm like, no, I'm going to work. I'm not turning around. It's not going to happen. So finally, she says, look, you're going to be wearing yoke all day on your pants and on your shirt. I mean, come on. So I, okay, fine. Turn around and we drive back home. My kids have come to love that story. And, and the reason that it still hangs around now after uh, almost 20 years uh, is that it plainly shows that I am not as infallible or iconic as I think I am. Sammy, I asked the question of Sammy this week as I was putting this together. I said, you know, you know about the egg sandwich story. He goes, oh yeah, I love the egg sandwich story. I'm like, why do you like it so much? And he goes, I get to laugh at your misfortune. Sammy, I love you too, buddy. But the question that I ask myself as I reflect on that story all these years later and still laugh about it is why at the time did I respond the way that I did? Why did, you know, I, I could have done so many other things and I erupted in anger and yelling and a few choice words that I'm not going to mention in church. I could have laughed like Sarah did at the absurdity of what just happened. I could have shrugged my shoulders and said, no, it's just an egg sandwich. And I mean, they're going to wash out of my pants. What's the big deal? I could have just, you know, turned around without making a noise and just said, "Mm." boy, I'm sorry that happened, but obviously it's not that big of a deal. I could have rolled my eyes at myself because oh boy, here I was doing something really dumb again, and, you know, I'm, I'm just being dumb, so why, why not roll my eyes at myself and move on? But instead, I erupt like Mount Vesuvius with a temper, and then spray anxiety thicker than the ash over Pompeii all over Sarah, the car, and everywhere. Now, The simple answer that I have asked myself as I have reflected, why did I respond the way that I did, I think is answered simply because the situation did not live up to my expectation. I wanted a nice, calm breakfast experience in the car with my new wife driving to work. And this egg sandwich had the tenacity and the arrogance to act in a way that did not respond in the way that I expected it to. (sighs) Frustrating aggravating, irritating, all of those things. Now, in reality, it clearly was operator error and not the egg in the sandwich that caused the problem. But it, when it, what happened wasn't what I was expecting to happen. I unloaded. And Sarah, you know, she had no such problem. She was smart enough to pop the yolk beforehand. She got to eat the rest of her sandwich and not throw it out the window. I was being dumb. And because I knew I was being dumb, it infuriated me that I had been dumb. I wish 
I could say that this was an isolated event, but the kids will tell you it is not. That oftentimes when the world doesn't respond the way that I expect it to, the way that I plan for it to respond, my instant expression is of sound and fury signifying nothing except my own embarrassment and shame, which is all that much is compounded all that much more because I lash out. <sighs> but if you peel back the emotional layers and the temper and the anger enough, it was my pride ultimately that was the problem. I thought I was the center of the universe and because the universe didn't respond the way that I wanted to respond, I'm going to throw a temper tantrum right here and right now. Now, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but how often do we all get obsessed with what we want when we want it? And when things don't work the way that we wanted them to, how do we respond? Is it the temper tantrum that I displayed, or is it some other way? It's in these moments that that basic question that we've probably all heard before really comes into play. What would Jesus do? And if we take a moment to analyze that question in the midst of the situation before instantly responding, it might save us some additional embarrassment and shame. We always have a choice to enter a situation responding as Christ would have us to do or responding in the way that our emotions would invite us to. Our good old limbic system, that reptilian response in our brain that short circuits our reason and our thinking. That's oftentimes why we find ourselves so far out in front of our own rationality that we've already responded by the time we've processed what has taken place. Now, we've talked in the past couple of weeks about the letters that Paul has written to a couple different churches. So we, we the first week we talked about Corinthians, and now we're into Philippians. And Paul is writing this letter from a prison cell somewhere. We're not entirely sure, but most scholars think it's Rome, that this um, is at the end of the journey that's described in the book of Acts, where Paul goes from Jerusalem um, across the Mediterranean Sea and ends up in Rome and is in a prison cell awaiting uh, trial and sentencing, or what would equate to trial and sentencing in our system. Um, he is stuck there in limbo, not knowing if he's going to be saved or executed, not knowing what is going to happen. All he knows is that at some point, somebody's going to drag him out of this cell before somebody in power, and they're going to make a decision as to what happens to him. Now think about how would you respond if you were Paul in that situation? You've been imprisoned unfairly. All you've been doing is sharing your faith, and this has landed you in chains in, a, uh, in Rome, where you have no access to anything. They stripped you of everything but what you're wearing. You don't even have food to eat. They're not even going to provide that. And you've got to wait for years for someone, for a court or a, a magistrate or somebody, to let you know what's ultimately going to happen to you. How do you respond to that? You are nothing. You have nothing. You hope for nothing. What do you do? Paul responds in the letter to the Philippians, which is often called the epistle of joy by pouring out his heartfelt feelings for the work that the Philippian church is doing, rejoicing with them and sharing with them the good news. And he begins this passage from chapter 2 uh, that Laura just read for us, asking this question, is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? That's a rhetorical question because he knows the answer is yes. He can ask that question in that way because he's got the joy of Christ in his heart. And he goes on asking more questions until he comes to verse 5. To experience all that Christ has for you, you have to have the same attitude as Christ Jesus. Christ who humbled himself and took the form of a servant, of a slave, so that he could experience the fullness of God here in this place Humility is one of the keys to being like Jesus. And Christ, Paul spells it out here as a follower of Christ. Now, we have learned over the years, through lots of research and conversation, and if you look in the literature for today, you, you figure out 
in terms of leadership, something that you probably already know. But humility means a lot when it comes to being a faithful disciple and being a good leader. If you want to be a key part of your family, one who invites trust and love and care in your house, start with humility. If you want to be a good team player, whether it's on the field playing a sport or in the boardroom working on a project, be humble and watch how the team values your participation. If you encourage and share, it makes a world of difference, doesn't it? If you want to be a leader in the world, humility will be the way that you win over followers and influence people. Not by building yourself up, but by building others up. In his book, Good to Great, author Jim Collins, who is a researcher in business environments and talks a lot about leadership out in the world, shares the attributes of what he calls a level five leader. Now, for those of you who don't know what a level five leader is, let me take a moment to explain it. It's someone who can take a large organization and do a turnaround through and with that organization to change the path of the direction the organization is going. So, for example, think of, uh, in World War II, things were bad for the Allies, right? And then the United States enters, and all of a sudden, Eisenhower becomes the, the commander-in-chief of the European theater, right? And through persistence and hard work and a lot of dedication by a lot of people, he helps that organization turn around and ultimately wins the war. Him and the organization, not just him. Colin says that this is not simply willpower to make this happen, to, to get to that next level of leadership or discipleship, right? If we're going to be true and faithful followers of Jesus, then hopefully we're good leaders and vice versa, because uh, there are distinct parallels between those two. Jesus invites us as disciples into this process of being humble. And another way to think about it, another example of, of how that is, is, is Collins actually picks this, uh, points this out in his book. He says this. He says, look at Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln never let his ego get in the way of his primary ambition for the larger cause of sustaining the nation. He was ready to listen to anyone and often willing to let others take, others' ideas take center stage. Yet those who who mistook Lincoln's personal modesty, shy nature, and awkward manner at times as signs of weakness were sorely mistaken. And the 600,000 dead during that conflict, and even the ultimate loss of his own life, point to his willingness to persevere through the midst of challenge and be a great leader. If we are willing to stand for what we believe in, we are invited to do that with humility and grace, not to point to ourselves, but to point to something greater, to the cause that we are supporting, to the work that we are doing, to the God that invites us into salvation. When we point to the one, Christ Jesus, who has called those beliefs out of us and invited us to take a step in faith, sharing the good news, we participate in bringing the kingdom. And the light doesn't shine on us when we do it in that way. It shines on the work that is happening in the kingdom. How do we do this, though? We do it the way that Paul lays out, by becoming more and more like Christ every single day. We practice our faith. That means that we work on our formation to be more like Christ every day. We practice our spiritual disciplines. We engage in others in conversation and in talk and we let the Holy Spirit help us reflect we take time to contemplate and we take time to engage out in the world when we are willing to go up the metaphorical mountain and sit with Christ there the power of the Holy Spirit will transform us into the image of Christ over the past couple of weeks, we've talked a lot about how we've reached a place in our national conversation where we're not able to have a, a genuine, deep, authentic conversation without major conflict. It seems like every time someone opens their mouth, they're yelling at someone else. 
how could we as people of faith help make a change in the perspective of the conversation or those engaged in the conversation if we start from a place of humility and humbleness and grace and L-O-V-E love? What would that look like? It's hard work to be the one at the table who speaks calmly with empathy, compassion, and love instead of yelling right back like I did when that egg sandwich exploded in my mouth. But it's the only way to make a difference. Martin Luther King said, you don't combat hate with hate, you combat hate with love. And humility has to be a piece of that. Now that doesn't mean that we're doormats, right? That we don't stand up for what we believe in. We just don't have to, to be over the top and angry about it. We do it in love and compassion, humility and humbleness. We let go of the pride and arrogance to think that we have the answer. We're the only ones that can fix it. We have the best solution to the problem at hand. We engage in conversation and speak in compassion and listen to the other voices in the room as we go about seeking justice. Because ultimately, if we're living into that role of disciple, the goal is not to make us the best disciple that we can be so that we can be the best disciple that we can be. The goal of discipleship is always to point towards Jesus and to allow Jesus to shine through us. How often have you heard it said that sometimes you are the only Jesus that people see in their day? And that's what we want from one another and out in the world. We are called to be like Christ. We are called to share Christ and even participate in death sometimes. Death to our own ego, death to our own ambition. Because Christ was willing to die on a cross so that as Paul says, at the name of Jesus, someday every tongue will declare, every knee will bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's what it means to heal our pride. That it is not us out in front, but Christ living in us. That Christ may shine through us, that we may become more and more like Christ. Test, test, son. Good. Uh, this is the time where we share our prayers and concerns. And um, uh, keep in mind that I'll walk to you and I'll extend the mic and I'll hand it to you. And so try to project and, and we'll repeat as needed. So today we want to pray for obviously all those affected by COVID. I'm sorry? Oh, thanks. Um, pray for all those affected by COVID, um, our nation to come together amidst all the tension and, and the election thing. Um, prayers and concerns for, uh, or concern for victims of natural disasters, aid workers and missionaries who are serving across the world, our military, current and veteran, uh, those who face uh, war, terrorism and oppression throughout the world, of those incarcerated with their families, uh, those being treated for cancer and other terminal illnesses, um, all those who are ill and in need of healing, all those who are weary, those who are lonely and isolated, caregivers, all those who are struggling, the homeless and economically disadvantaged in our communities, all those who are grieving, and the church as a whole, our leadership, and, and all those involved in this ministry. Um, walk so anybody okay. um, I received a text message from a friend Laurel Lavornia her husband Mark Lavornia his mother passed away last week and she's been struggling for a while and it's, uh, you know, it's a 
tough time, but of course it was a blessing. Joan Lavorne. Next week I'll be traveling down to my father-in-law's house. My husband's dead. His grandmother on October 6th will be turning 100. And her main health issues, of course, is hard of hearing, can't see, and some beginning of dementia, but otherwise he's very healthy. listening to Tom Sermon made me think of yesterday being a great leader at work. Um, Dale Cropper headed up a team to do a ramp build for a young lady in uh, Westover. And we got there and we had this beautiful plan and if we followed the plan the ramp was probably going to end somewhere in a fence or in the middle of her yard, I don't know. And, but seeing how he worked and the team came together to to make this happen and the lady, young lady wheeled out in her um, wheelchair, a remote wheelchair. She had never had it out of the house yet because she couldn't get it out. And she was just glowing. And we just had a, a great day. The Crowder family fed us. Um, and so thank you guys. But man, that went right along with today's message. <laughs> the young woman, I believe it was um, MS. I believe she has MS and she's in her early 40s and so to think about that it puts a lot of things into perspective. Uh, please, please pray for my friend Krista. She lost her husband this week to COVID here in Salisbury. Just a couple of days he was fine last weekend. So let's play for, pray for our friend Krista and her family. ask you to keep my sister Sandra in your prayers. She's recovering from um, gastrointestinal surgery. And also my daughter's mother-in-law, uh, Ellie, who is being treated for lung cancer. Anyone else? So yeah, it was kind of a neat thing today was I was, as I was preparing for this, I promised I didn't call Tom, um, but I kind of pulled a kind of a classic off the shelf and so I want to I want to pray this and if you know it please feel free to join and then we'll do those prayer. Lord make me an instrument of thy peace where there is hatred let me sow love where there is injury pardon where there is doubt faith where there is despair hope where there is darkness light and where there is sadness O oh, Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, for it is in dying to self that we are born to eternal life. Please join me in the prayer of our Father's eyes. Our Father. As the praise team comes up to help us pray uh, through music, 
Pride in one's work and accomplishments brings satisfaction and contentment. When we have done a job well, that is a source of contentment and satisfaction. But when ego and pride get in the way of our becoming more like Christ, we need to take a step back and reassess. One of the ways that we do that is through generosity. It helps amazingly with humility because it reminds us that we are not the center of the universe and that there are others in our world, others that God calls us to care for. When we give, we surrender ourselves and our treasure to something bigger than ourselves. May God bless us in our giving today. And so you're invited to come and bring your offerings up to place them in the basket as the praise team leads us in prayer through song. And if you've got any prayer requests or uh, any of the contact cards that you've filled out, please feel free to drop them in the basket as well. Come as the Spirit leads.
going to invite you to stand for our sending forth. So if you could open up your uh, uh, worship booklet to that page so that we can read this or, or share in this together. We go in peace and in humility to love and serve the Lord. May we be made whole in our outreach to the world. Open our eyes, Lord. We want to see Jesus. You reach out and touch him and say that we love him. Open our ears, Lord. Help us to 